Well, hi to YouTube family. It's Bolt CRNA coming to you again with another day's topic. Today, we are being graced with Joseph Rodriguez's CRNA's presence again. He has allowed us to pick his brain about his personal time becoming a CRNA, becoming a CRNA practice owner, what was his specific path, questions about how long it took him to become an independent provider out in the business community, how many practices does he own, what his day-to-day -day life is like, more specific questions on this video on exactly what his path has been and what he deals with daily. Let's get into it. All right, YouTube family, here we are with Mr. Joe Rodriguez. Joe, are you are you working on your doctorate now or did you finish your doctorate? I am, I am. And when I finish, I would prefer to be addressed as Dr. Master. I was gonna say, if you all have the time. your doctorate, I was certainly going to say Dr. Rodriguez here. I wasn't gonna yes. uh, skimp you like that. You can call me Master Rodriguez until That's then, just true. You know, to make it you know, proper. That's exactly the degree. true. I'm all about being proper, no doubt That's, about it. Yes. So all your master's level CRNAs out there, they do request the master last name yes. title. Yep. That's right. Like a Jedi, basically. <laughs> so yeah. we are back again this week, guys. Last week, we talked about in the general sense of CRNAs and independent practice and what that lifestyle is like and some of the barriers and things you should consider. This week, we're talking about exactly what Joe's experience was like and uh, what it's been like from his day-to-day -day life, how he is a business manager and how that goes along with being a CRNA and how he juggles both aspects. One of the first things that people on my Instagram asked me about when I prompted them is they wanted to know first, where did you go to CRNA school and how did you survive CRNA school? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, you know, when I was in my program, like I did everything mm -hmm. to make sure I got through. Kid, you know, these kids don't realize this is a high risk financial thing you're getting involved in. You can't discharge this debt in bankruptcy, right? And even, you know, CRNA school is very expensive. Overall, the ROI is still very good, right? You can earn, you know, easily four to six million in your career. Um, and if you don't spend too much, you can save a lot of it, right? But when I was in my program, I had that number in my, not the million, I had the school debt number in my mind. Uh, so the way I got through it was literally anything I had to do to get through that day with that, whoever my preceptor was, whether it was being prepared or being deferential or being humble, I wanted to go through no drama, just get through and get as many experiences and skills as I possibly could. Your first question, I went to Thomas Jefferson University and to my knowledge, I was the first that went to a place called Methodist Hospital in Philadelphia. There was a group there called the Rothman Institute that did I don't know, 40 shoulders a day, 20 to 40. Wow. So it was a great experience. I knew I was coming to Arizona. I knew I wanted those peripheral nerve block skills, which are really a basic skill. Um, but you know, after you do 40 or 50 of them, you get to a decent level. But I was the first one to do that, right? And so I wanted to make the right kind of waves, but not the dramatic, you know, HR related waves. And that's how you get through. You do anything you need to. Yeah. Do everything you can while also remaining under the radar, not getting in trouble. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You want to be in the right type of the good trouble. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how long did you work after you graduated? Of course, how long did you work as a CRNA in a larger hospital with more of a care team, you know, supervision, whatever type model before you moved on to independent practice? Sure. So it's key for people who are asking this question to realize it's a it's a double edged sword. There's a bit of a paradox here. You when you first get out of school, there is a ton more to learn, right? There's so much more to learn to get comfortable with, to develop your skills. But if you are in a very controlled environment, there comes a point in that curve when your skills actually begin to deteriorate and your knowledge begins to deteriorate because you're not using it all the time, right? So yes, you want to get into a practice with support and mentorship, but you don't want to get into a practice where that deterioration happens. For me personally, uh, I found a practice that was collaborative, somewhere between medical supervision and collaborative practice. I think, you know, the, the practitioners there as physicians and CRNAs, they knew, hey, when you're new, this is a tough place to work. Patients were sick, right? We, nobody wants a bad outcome, right? Nobody wants to get in your business all the time, but, you know, we got to make sure the patients are safe. So when you're brand new, it was like, I was asking tons of questions every day. You know, I was running like cases by people all the time, right? Because I still had a lot to learn. But then once I got, you know, year two, year three, I began to moonlight at other places. And that's when I, I realized I was going weeks and months without input because I had seen more, right? And a lot of this 
is an experience, a volume of experience game. Other thing for me is that I, I worry, I went back and did the math on my, uh, my 1099 for that year because it was 1099 when I first started. And I worked like 60 hours a week, every week for wow. 50 weeks. It was incredible. I put in so much time in the OR because I, I wasn't good at saying no at the time, but I also wanted that experience. I wanted to be extremely valuable to that practice mm -hmm. because if anything happened, I, I wanted to be someone that would stick around. Yeah, And that was how I began to transition out to more autonomous and, and truly independent and solo practice when you begin to you know, most cases go fine, right? So you need lots and lots of cases to accumulate the difficult experiences. That's what's going to make you a more safe, competent, and professional provider when you're on your own. Right. So how many years would you say estimate? It, yeah, I mean, well, right away, I got into that very autonomous, uh, that somewhere between supervision, medical supervision and collaboration. Right. And then it was probably year two, year three, where yeah. I really began. And it was a transition over time. It wasn't like a switch, yeah. right? And a lot of some of that has to do with even case selection and an opportunity, but it's really, I want to say it was from an organizational standpoint, I realized that I wanted to be independent, not in a, I mean, practice way too, but in a legal way, I went, I remember talking to the, the MD owner, uh, the founder of that group, and we were sitting in the lunchroom and I said, Hey, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I really want to get involved here. I want to help make things better. I'll, I'll work on the schedule. You know, we could do that better. I'll write policies. So we, you know, can protect ourselves from liability. And he said, well, if, uh, if you wanted to do that, you should have been an MD. And I was like, oh, well, clearly what I'm talking about has nothing to do. We, I mean, you could pay an administrative assistant to do what I'm offering to do. Right. But uh, that was when I realized I was like, you know what? I think I can do this better with better people, people who I can really trust and right. build something, build something cool. So that's, yeah. uh, that's what I did. I got some great partners and a uh, great rest of the team and, and go out. Yeah. So it's been great. Okay. Nice. So how did you get your practice started and how much capital did you have to invest to really get yourself to, to kind of the level that you're at now? Sure. Sure. So there's, it's probably a three-part answer, right? I, I mean, my specific experience to go kind of middle of the road fell into this opportunity and I was out there, I was hustling, I was trying to meet people, blah, blah, blah. Um, this administrator, I was on my state board. I was active in my association. This administrator of a facility knew me from a conference and uh, they made a change. She called me. I was there the next day, right? That turned into all of a sudden we had like 40 shifts to cover over like two months. And, uh, you know, over, I want to say like eight different offices. Um, uh, my memory might be failing me because it maybe it was all I remember is it was tens of thousands of dollars. And I remember emptying all my bank accounts. Uh, I never told my wife this up, up until years later. And then she heard me giving a lecture and she's like, you did what? And I was like, no, wow. it's okay. It all, it all worked <laughs> out. But yeah. uh, I was to the point where like in three days, my mortgage was due, right? So the three of us, I believe the three of us put about 120,000 up total. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was our initial capital investment. And eventually the billing started coming in weeks and months later. And I was able to get recoup that loss um, wasn't able to recoup all the losses and fees, but I did what I had to do. Most people start with small, you know, offices, one to two offices, not a lot of capital involved there. You know, if it's just you or you and a few other people, but as the situation becomes more complex, right? Mm -hmm. We just took on a, a contract with uh, Banner Casa Grande outside of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. and this is just rough off, off the top of my head. But I want to say that the initial capital investment was somewhere around five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? So that means, you know, that money that's coming in from other places, you have to. Very few people work for free, as it turns out. So for those folks, I mean, that was a huge capital investment mm -hmm. uh, that we made, and yeah, I think that number is about accurate, actually. So, wow. yeah, so it can really vary, um, but it is not as simple as you know. People like to simplify, oh, it's just business money in, money out. It's like a lemonade stand. And that is absolutely not the case. Yeah. And and I'm sure there's, I've heard from other people who are practice owners that when you're dealing with reimbursement things, you know, you oh, provide the service and then now you're waiting on the reimbursement to come in to pack for the service you provided six weeks ago or something. And they're debating with you about not wanting to pay. And so, you oh, yeah. Left oh, yeah. You have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea how many cases we haven't been paid for. And 
it's funny because I'll have conversations with folks and say, well, we generated this much and that's how much it should be paid. But re it's reality. It's like, no, that's not. That's what you read on the Internet you generated. That's not real life. Even with a Medicare case, you know, lots of grandmas don't pay their 20 percent. And most people I know are not willing to take to risk 20 percent. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's really two different markets, which comes with upsides and downsides in both the employment or, co or subcontractor market versus managing the actual contract market. Very different sets of skills and responsibilities and costs involved. Yeah, when I was in CRNA school, I rotated for two months at a CRNA only practice where they did erector spinae blocks for total mm -hmm. vaginal hysterectomies. And they would insert catheters and the patients did really well afterwards. The surgeons really loved it. You know, they the, the CRNA group did it for the um, you know positive outcomes afterwards. But when they would bill, I believe it's Medicare, they weren't getting reimbursed for it at all. Mm. Like there was not a way to code for that type of block or maybe yeah. they decided that, they, that that wasn't in a block that they wanted to reimburse for. I'm not sure what the details were, but they weren't getting paid to do it and they knew they weren't gonna get paid for doing it. And they still did it anyway as a way to show that they were a valuable service to the facility, to the surgeons, sure. for the patients. And so they just took a loss on that. So that's yep. something that you have to consider sometimes as a practice owner or a independent provider that sometimes it's not a one-to-one -one provide the service, this exact ratio. Of you get paid. It's not a cash business. I wish it was. It'd be a lot cheaper. Healthcare would be a lot cheaper, I think. But no, that's, that's just not the way this business works. So they want to know, do you still practice anesthesia with all this business stuff you're doing all the time? How often do you practice anesthesia? Yeah. So the answer is yes, I do. I'm probably 60, 40, 50, 50, depending on the week. And that 60 can go either way. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I know I, our practice, the, the, the handful of us that got this started, we're all excellent or are all excellent clinicians, right? Because it was our name on the proverbial door, right? So we established that and like attracts like, right? So we would recruit and make it competitive and make it a good deal for similar people. We want to be around those types of people, not just people who have excellent clinical skills, but also people skills. That's the type of people that we want. And I, I like to think I'm, I still have, you know, I, that's what I'm still doing. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to talk about, I guess, not going to brag about my own skills, but I like to think I'm pretty uh, decent at it at least. Nice. Do you have like yeah. one home base that you typically go back to, to do your practice or do you have like multiple facilities you visit? So yeah, I, I do visit multiple facilities. I play a leadership role at Tri-City Surgery Center in Prescott, Arizona. I actually fulfill their medical director responsibilities, which is not med it's not practicing medicine. It's primarily administrative mm -hmm. and overseeing the anesthesia department. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I also go to other facilities. It's just smart to maintain a diverse practice. And I bring those lessons back to Tri-City with me. And I, I'm really close with the folks at Tri-City. And other one thing we do in our group, one thing that frustrated me about the previous group I started with was there was really no leadership opportunities. Mm -hmm. And like, you want to make things better. I mean, leadership is really just trying to make things better and being willing to put in the work. And when you have somebody like that, you don't tell them no, you tell them yes, <laughs> you know, and you find a place where they can contribute. So other people do that in other facilities. I do it at Tri-City and with the, the group more largely as well. We have a weekly board meeting, so to speak, or team meeting, whatever you want to call it, where, nice. we, uh, where we go over those things and a million phone calls in between, that's for sure. So that kind of blends into my next question. What is your typical schedule like, say Monday through Sunday, whatever? What do you typically do as a provider, as an anesthesia provider, but also as a practice owner and a businessman? Sure. I mean, you're going to get a different answer from any anybody. You're going to get a different answer from the other leaders in our group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's one guy who helped get it off the ground, Randy Quinn. He's been in the operating room like 50 hours a week, every week for the past year, because he's getting this big hospital contract off the ground. Um, my personal practice, again, it depends on the week. You know, I think I was in my home office like two days this week, uh, but off, I'm basically on call for the OR in those days. And I try to get as much done as I can. And then I'll just jump into the OR as needed to cover gaps, give some breaks, you know, some surgeon ran late. Now we have, so I'll fill in in that way. Right. And that's a value add service for the, the facilities that we cover. And we use a similar model outside of my area as well to try and be as flexible as possible right. for our, our clients. But day to day, I mean, I wake up every day around 4.45. Uh, often I will go to the, go to the gym early on, depending on my schedule, but I try to get it done early in the morning. I am usually sitting at my computer by 6am and I will work until my wife starts to give me dirty looks, oh, okay. which is usually around 530 or so. So I, I, um, and I, you know, often work week. I mean, 
look, it, your business ownership, um, there's, there's, if you want to be a business owner, it is usually because of who you are. It's not really because of the money. And in fact, for many years, I didn't make any additional money and I was working crazy hours, but we were investing it all back into the business, right? Trying to build something special. And we're, you know, we're still doing that. So uh, yeah, so that's it. If you, if you're, if you want to be a business owner, it's really about who you are yeah. rather than just, I want to make money. Cause there's other great ways to make money and more. So when you're sitting anybody at can desk, do anesthesia. when you're sitting at your desk at 6 AM and you're working on stuff, what is it? Are you like uh, negotiating new contracts with other facilities? Are you bidding on new groups? Are you dealing with HR issues uh, with, uh, you know, pre-existing groups? What is it typically you're managing? Uh, yes. The answer is yes. It really depends on the day. So, you know, our group takes a team of teams. It's, you know, kind of a businessy cliche approach. So if you're good at something, you tend to do a lot of it, but I try to be re competent at every other part of the business that you just mentioned. So writing contracts, creating pro formas, creating presentations. Um, I recently wrote a, a memo on delineation of privileges changes within the state of Arizona. Anybody's listening, you're getting like a full on, uh, insight into actually running an anesthesia group, right? Um, as, as opposed to some of the other things I see on YouTube. Um, so one area that I tend to do is, and I haven't done as much of it lately, but I tend to put together a lot of our presentations, mm -hmm. a lot, anytime we are presenting to a stakeholder, that is typically the role I will play in communicating our message and what makes us distinct in the yeah. market, right? We have one person who is an expert on regulatory issues. They were the president of the board of nursing for 10 years. We have another who's uh, arguably highly naturally skilled at contract negotiations and very uh, bottom line. So we very much have a team in place and we mix and match based on what we do. Uh, you know, but you know, the first, you know, I try to get through my emails. Uh, I try to leave with inbox zero every day. That okay. is, it's hard to do, but it can be done. And then I usually break my tasks up into what is important and urgent, mm -hmm. right? And what is not important, but urgent and I can do quickly. And then things that are neither important nor urgent. And I'll just do them when I need a break. Yeah, totally. So what you mentioned a lot of different terms and a lot of different uh, hats that you wear. Do you feel like CRNAs, especially those who are already, you know, they finished their DMP, like say myself, if we wanted to go into that kind of um, area of, of work like you do, do you think it's necessary for us to go back and get an MBA to do those things? Or could we learn those things uh, as we go? To answer your question, do you need an MBA? No, right? I do not have my MBA. Um, none of my, none of our team has, not a single person has their MBA, mm -hmm. at least until very, very recently. Now, can you figure a lot of these things out on your own? Yeah. Right. And there's no book to read specifically on anesthesia business, at least one that's not been updated. Mm -hmm. However, as your organization grows, right. And as you begin to get into a more of a red ocean environment, mm -hmm. which I can explain in just a moment, when you're in that red ocean environment, it helps to think differently because running a business, taking on risk is not the same thing as performing a safe anesthetic. In fact, well, the two are almost opposite, right? One is inherently risky, right? The other one, we're always trying to minimize risk. And in business, you have to take on risk to, right. to get there. So once your business gets to the point where the problems that you were solving with one or 20 or even 50, well, maybe not 50, that gets pretty complex, one or 20 or 25 people, once you hit that hockey stick uh, type marker, your problems and the complexity of those problems are gonna keep, keep going up. Mm -hmm. That's when it helps to have someone with healthcare business expertise mm -hmm. who can help you do strategy and operations, mm -hmm. right? And everything else that goes along with running a business. So that gives me a perfect segue into the other question is, how did you learn all this? How did you learn the ins and outs of the business and uh, the anesthesia business specifically? Yeah, this is kind of a paradoxical answer, right? Because a lot of people in this business can be greedy, right? And that's a great way not to learn. You'll figure out something and you, you know, you probably have a decent, you know, mildly successful business, but if you want key insights on how to get off the ground quickly and talk to the right people, the key is to serve, right? It's to do things for other people. And like people hear that and they're like, well, why would I get involved with my association? 
you know, that doesn't make any sense. It's going to use all this time. But in reality, once people see you contributing to a very unique profession like we have, that is when they're going to be willing to speak to you, willing to talk to you and share their insights. I remember my first ANA meeting. So the answer, the, the short answer to your question is people, mm -hmm. right? You get in touch with people, you learn from other people, right? My first ANA meeting, I got, you know, I was hanging out in the, the lobby or something like that. And, you know, people could tell I was, I was just like you, actually, you know, people could tell I wanted to be part of this. I wanted to learn. This is awesome. This is such a great profession. It, it is worth fighting for. What a cool opportunity. And this very experienced, very respected CRNA, his name was Dan Simonson. Um, he, he pulled me over and he, he brought me into this literal smoke filled room in this Seattle hotel, like on the 50th floor or whatever. And we're looking out over Seattle. And I was like, holy Mac, these are like the heavyweights of the CRNA profession are here. And uh, this guy who's kind of uh, maybe a little bit newer himself, he just pulled me aside and said, you're, you're in the right place. If you network, if you connect with the right people, you can do anything. Hmm. And I, I remember that experience very clearly. And I ran, and my personality is such, I like connecting with new people, but it's all these people that I've connected with. And I, you know, it's not like you ask the same person every question, right? They're not going to like tell you everything in one conversation, but it's a, over a series of time, you build relationships, you do things together, right? You do things that benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. And then they're willing to mentor you. And that's, that's basically how I learned everything I know, to be perfectly honest. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I've, I learned so much just from doing a similar thing, just being eager, uh, introducing myself to everyone. I, I actually did a mentorship through the AANA, our, the communications committee, which I'm also on the communications committee. So, you know, shout out. Yeah, to that's great. Uh, they do a mentorship program at Mid-Year Assembly every year. And I did it as a student. It's for students. And they pick like 50 students usually and one for each state typically. And they'll have one mentor from each, one CRNA mentor from each state. So they'll pair up with one student and that person will guide you through the whole mid-year assembly and kind of walk you around and introduce you to people. They just set you up for opportunities to be connected and networked and to get that opportunity like you just mentioned. Right. And my, my mentor told me back then, he said, hey, print out business cards, bring business cards with your face on it, get like a good looking shot of yourself with your information. And it's kind of cheesy, but people will remember the fact that you handed out business cards with your face on it as a student, anesthesia student. And they did. It made quite the stir. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, it's that kid with those business cards he's handing out. To yep. everybody. It's like it's kind of a, almost really a joke, but still it got your name out there. People remembered me for better or worse. And uh, and so, yeah, that's it's where I learned a lot of stuff. I, I found a lot of mentors through that process and people I keep in touch with today. So. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I remember your business cards actually. So you remember well done for you. here we are years later. Yeah. In clinical Sharing knowledge with people. Yeah. One, one of the uh, clinical uh, program uh, directors or whatever at one of my clinical sites, he was there at mid-year and he brought one business card back to clinicals and, and I got some mocking for that for a little bit afterwards. Yeah. But it was worth it. <laughs> That's all right. Haters um, can hate, right? Yeah. Let them hate. Um, so what are the business opportunities out there for CRNAs? beyond just practicing in a hospital setting that you think of when you think of a CRNA? Sure. Well, I, I, to be perfectly honest, I've never seen more market. I mean, maybe I'm more aware of it now than I was previously, but everything that's happening in healthcare like screams opportunity mm -hmm. right? for people who want to take on the burden of leadership, who are willing to risk right, who are interested in that level of service, because on some level, even running a business, it is just providing a service. And maybe that's why there's so much overlap between association leaders and business leaders, right? right. So, you know, many CRNA, I, I probably get an, an email or a text or a message, a DM once a week from somebody who has a business opportunity because demand is skyrocketing in the current infrastructure cannot handle it, right? That now when people hear demand is skyrocketing, they're thinking, oh, maybe I'll make 400 grand next year. Well, it's not generally how it works. Number one, things don't change that quickly. But number two, the value equation, right? We talked about this in our first call. If you can provide a better service and you, you probably will earn something more, right? If you can figure out that value equation in, at the local level, and that usually comes through service, right? Whether it's serving on a hospital committee or serving in your Boy Scout troop or your little league or wherever else, when people see 
that you have those qualities in you, yeah, you're, you're going to find out about opportunities. And then the next step is, you know, you connect with, you know, someone like myself, others who can help you navigate those next opportunities. Because when you get a business off the ground, you can partner certain parts of the business with other people. And we've done that and help them get their, they might not want to do all the heavy lifting that we've now done, right? right? And they might just want to, they want a piece of the business, so to speak, but they don't want to take on all the big headaches, right? Right. Or you can literally build it up from the ground up, you know, like Larry Hornsby and Juan Quintana and, and Paul Santoro, Bob Galvin, the people that I looked up to. Right. Um, you know, they've they've built those businesses often from the ground up or built it up significantly from where they bought it. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but oh yeah, nice. you know, there's lots of different levels of of things you can do there. A little Absolutely. bit of money or from the ground up, you're on your own if you want. Yeah. Um, how about becoming a partner in a practice? Is it difficult to find a group if uh, you wanted to become like a partner in that group? Is it difficult to find that situation? I think the more, maybe the more insightful question is what does partnership mean, mm. right? So sorry, I, I have a clock on my computer. What is part, when somebody asks, I wanna be a partner, my next question is, well, what do you really want out of that? Is it more money? Yeah. Is it control? Is it ownership mm -hmm. and then what does that ownership really mean i'll give you an example the most one of the most common structures out there i think in our neck of the industry is you have eight crnas right and they're all partners mm -hmm. great you know that's that's awesome but the difference between being a partner and a w2 you know if that partnership in the operating agreement or the contract of that partnership if you're not performing the duties you have basically have a 90 day out that's not much different than a 1099 arrangement, mm -hmm. right? And if all of the uh, revenue is flowing out to the partners, right? And it's not significantly higher than the market for a normal employee or, or a 1099 can make, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of value there to sell, right? Yeah. And, and it's just a partnership and it, it doesn't really add a lot to your life, right? One, the other half of that is when people ask about partnership, they're thinking about ownership and equity. And I tell folks that the contract has to match the relationship, mm -hmm. right? And that breaks out in two distinct ways. The first is if someone comes to me and says, hey, I want to be a partner in this part of the business, I want to know, is this the type of person that I need to, I should get involved in, yeah. right? And is what they're asking, you know, if they come and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take 90 and you're going to take 10, but you're, you're going to use this thing that you've built to get that 10. Uh, that doesn't really match the relationship, right? Especially if I'm personally going to be involved. And I'll tell you, Jason, that is what happens the vast majority of times. I see. Right? You know, people say, hey, I want to solve all these problems. And then when the problems come up, they're like, hey, I'm, it's past five o'clock and I don't want to take that phone call. Right. But that's not a good contractual relationship. Yeah. The last part I'll mention is... You know, there is a model out there that's similar to law firms, right? Where you, you know, you earn 40, 50, 60% of your billable hours or your billable cases. And eventually after years of that, you buy into the partnership or something, you make partner in the yeah. firm. That model, even in the law firm industry has essentially gone away. It's just ah. not as common anymore. It's, and it's not as common in our business because the revenue isn't there, right? The margins are relatively small. I mean, if anybody wants to be a billionaire, you should go on Shark Tank. You know, you should not be going into the anesthesia business. Like I said earlier, this is more about the challenges that you want to take on. Yeah. For me, it's about the difference you can make in an industry mm -hmm. and or in a, in a specialty. It's about demonstrating that CRNAs and MDs can have productive collaborative relationships and get away from all the political garbage and right. to provide value to our community by doing it. I like that. I like that explanation. I can't do that anywhere else, right? I. Right. Not at this level, at least. Right. So what about, this is like the general generic question of if you could do this all over again, what would you have done differently? If anything. Sure, sure. I think it's hard for me to say that I would have done things differently because I like to think things have worked out fairly well. However, some things I would have legitimately done is learn, I would have figured myself out more and learned my own weaknesses better and yeah. been more honest with myself. I can speak fairly well. And I, you know, I've speak, spoken around the country, et cetera, et cetera. Speaking is different than communicating. Right. Very different. 
I didn't know that when I got started, I would have gotten better at that first, right? Um, and I only say that because there's been, because I think a largely my own failures in communicating, we've had some tension within the leadership of the group, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I would have gotten to know myself better, so to okay. speak. One thing that I tell people is that, you know, having partners is a double-edged sword. So if you have partners, right, especially if you're growing a business, that is a high risk, high reward endeavor. Mm. When I had first had my partnership, I went to one of those mentors I described. And the first thing he I said, Hey, how would you go about this? He's the first thing he said was don't have a partner, do it on your own. Mm. However, we have grown way like significantly faster and that for me personally, that would have never been possible to do on my own. So that's something people should consider about doing differently. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, now, Joe, where can people find you if they're looking for how to connect with you, maybe to follow you or even do business with you? Where's the best place to reach you at? Sure. I mean, if, if you're looking at the business side, I mean, I don't think most of us are on all the major networks, right? If you Google Joe Rodriguez CRNA, most of the stuff is going to pop up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I'm on LinkedIn at, you know, Joe Rodriguez CRNA, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, our website is AZ as in Arizona, AS as in aortic stenosis uh, dot team. It doesn't really stand for that. It stands for Arizona Anesthesia Solutions. That is our Arizona brand. We're part of a larger company actually called Anesthesia Partners and Management. But azas.team, easy way to get in touch and go from there. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Joe, and talking to everybody, giving us these details. Some people have been asking about this. I think it's great to get this details out there because there's not much material on this out there on the internet. So it's mm -hmm. good well, happy to help. All right, guys, hit me up in the comments below if you have any questions. Go follow Joe Rodriguez and connect with him if you're interested in getting involved. And until next time, that's bold out.